time over there. I want to call this meeting to order, welcome you all to Brookfield. And I want to thank the Brookfield Library for their cooperation in setting up this meeting and also local law enforcement for their service this evening. The library closes at 9 o'clock and we need to wrap up this meeting no later than 8.45 p.m., which means that we have to have this room vacated by 8.45. I appreciate the opportunity to hear your concerns. In fact, in 2017, I held 115 public meetings, and I've logged about 50 so far this year. You may have heard that some of these meetings have become very contentious, so I want to be sure to review the rules that we need to adhere to so that we can have an orderly environment in which to exchange ideas. First, I ask that you all sign in with my staff. If you would like an opportunity to speak, you need to check the speaking box that appears in the sign-up slips. That way I'll know to call on you during the first part of this meeting. I will give a priority to those of you who reside in Brookfield, and then if time permits, I will continue to call on residents of the 5th Congressional District. If additional time is available, I will call on those who don't reside in the 5th District. I expect participants to be respectful and to allow the person who is recognized and has the floor the opportunity to speak without interruption, as well as when I respond to each comment. Further, if the question you would like to ask or the comment that you would like to make has already been made, just say so and then please but refrain from asking it again. We should try to hear from as many of you as we can on in as many issues as we can within the time constraints. If at any time participants become rude or disruptive, I will immediately adjourn the meeting because there is nothing positive to be gained from continuing with a meeting that is disorderly. We can all agree without becoming disagreeable. Signs are okay in this room as long as they are neither disruptive nor obstructive. The second portion of the meeting will be devoted to those of you who seek my help with personal problems they are experiencing with the federal government. This part of the meeting is an opportunity for us to have a one-on-one -on -one private conversation and is not the time to continue discussions from the general part of the meeting. A lot of this has to do with people who have problems with VA medical. And, you know, if there's anything that should be private, if somebody talking about their medical issues and their problems that they're having with a government agency. So as a result, any filming or recording is prohibited during this part of the meeting. First part of the meeting will run through about 8.20 and then we'll get to the one-on-one -on -one personal problems time. All of that being said, first up in the general issues part of the meeting is Laurel Malone of Ruby Lane in Brookfield. Ms. Malone. I'd like to thank you for representing me and the laws of my country. And I would like to say that America is a nation of laws. If we no longer follow our laws, we are no longer a nation. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Andy Art, Woodmore Lane in Brookfield. Congressman Sensorbrenner, thank you very much for coming to Brookfield. I know you do that often. Can you tell me how the tax cuts are helping businesses in our district? Could you repeat that, please? I didn't hear it. Can you tell me how tax cuts are helping our businesses in your district? Well, you know, the answer is the tax cut means that you get to spend more of your money rather than my colleagues and me deciding what's best on how to spend your money. Uh, when you put more money in people's pockets, uh, there's more spending that goes on. Uh, the people where the money is spent uh, end up being able to expand their business and hire more people. And I can say specifically uh, with respect to the corporate tax rate cuts, uh, this is keeping business in the United States and attracting business uh, that left the United States to come back home. Uh, we have the highest corporate tax rate in the world of any industrialized country uh, prior to the signing of the tax cut bill. And you already see the results where unemployment is almost at record lows, particularly minority unemployment. Uh, it's at about a 17 to 20 year uh, low now. There are more people working. You know, we actually have a job shortage. And as you know, the more people that work, uh, the more people earn money, which uh, they can dispose of. And that income is taxed, and we're able to get more tax revenue. 
Now, there are a lot of people that seem to think that tax cuts, you know, are a Republican idea. They were not. They were first proposed by President Kennedy in the early 1960s, when the top individual rate was 91 percent. He cut it to 70 percent, and as a result, there were more people working, there was more income, there was more income to be taxed at the 70 percent rate, uh, and as a result, the government made more money uh, than was anticipated. The second thing is, is that when President Reagan did his tax cuts in the 80s, during the 10 years after the tax cuts became effective, uh, the total collections by the IRS of individual income taxes doubled in those 10 years. And there was an increase in income tax collections beyond what was projected during the Bush tax cut of the last decade. So it's worked four times before. And it was a proposal by President Kennedy that ended up getting picked up by two Republican presidents and now a third. And it uh, basically got us out of recessions, got people back to work, got people off benefit programs, earning income, and earning income that was taxed. So it was a win-win situation for everybody. So I think the statistics that we've seen so far are really very good, and I look forward to seeing that continue. Thank you. Uh, John Purdue of Burnwood and Brookfield. Thank you for the time. I have a uh, manufacturing company in Menominee Falls. I've owned it for 21 years. I have more than increased the employment by fourfold. Uh, we make industrial control products, all solid state electronics, uh, circuit boards, using resistors, capacitors, all that heat electronics. Tomorrow, uh, is a Trump tariff that will be putting a 25% increase on every component that I buy. I estimate it will cost me $500,000. And if I can't get my customers to accept a 7 to 8% price increase for absolutely no reason at all and lose that much money, those employees that I have, I'll have to start letting go. I will be cutting salaries. I will be eliminating profit sharing. I'll be looking at eliminating uh, my 75% that I pay for health care. I have two questions for you. Number one, what happened to the three equal branches of government <laughs> where you guys have checks and balances on one guy making his own mind up? And the second part of the question is, what are you guys going to do about this? Okay, I'll answer both of them. Thank you. First of all, before I got to Congress, uh, legislative branch being the exclusive authority to set tariffs, increase them, decrease them, get rid of them, to the President of the United States. That was something that Congress gave away one of its powers. That was a mistake in my opinion, but that's what the law is today. The second question is that we will do what we can. You know, I was one of 101 Republican congressmen that wrote the President opposing his tariff proposals. I am against this tariff proposal. Can you change it? Can your Republican colleagues who control Can I get to that, please? Okay. Okay. I am, you know, against this tariff proposals. We can change it, but we would need to change it by passing a bill. Now, you know, I'm practical, and if you pass a bill, it goes before the president, and you know he will veto it. There are not the votes to override a veto. You know, I think that Bush lost none when there was a Republican Congress and eight during his last two years when there was a Democratic Congress. Obama lost only one in his whole eight years. So from a practical standpoint, the president will have an upper hand against Congress simply because there are votes that will vote to sustain the veto. I would vote to override a veto if that bill got to his desk, because I know what the impact is of retaliatory tariffs when we slap tariffs on another country. And your industry is one of many that are going to be hit. You know, farmers are probably going to be hit uh, the worst, you know, of all of them. You know, all of that being said, what can be done that's practical? What can be done that's practical is basically to work with the administration, you know, to try to jawbone them into relieving these tariffs. And I'm not so sure uh, that the tariffs are a part of Trump's bargaining uh, strategy to try to get 
the Canadians, the Europeans, and the Chinese into lowering tariffs against American products that are exported to those countries. So, in the case of the Europeans, you know who the collateral is? Excuse, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, sir. I'm trying to explain to you. Oh, man, I'm going to put this down as one interruption. I'm going to keep track. <laughs> 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 Uh, How many do you I'm get trying to explain stuff? what can be done under the law that it is today. And I was not there when the president was given the exclusive authority. So I can't be blamed for it. You know, the Congress gave up it's its authority, I think, uh, willingly, but it was a great big mistake on Congress's part. Again, I would vote to reverse that today, but it involves overriding the president's veto. Now, do you want people to posture on this, or do you want people to try to figure out how to get rid of these tariffs and maybe save your business and a lot of other businesses? And what I'm telling you, and you know, here I am in direct opposition to President Trump as a Republican. Uh, uh, I'm in direct opposition to him, but the way to do this is to jawbone with him. Uh, I'm not sure that this is not a bargaining chip, as I was. Uh, say, you know, and already he's beginning to get the Chinese to back down because uh, the, you know, the tariff screaming between Washington and Beijing started before the tariff screaming uh, between Washington and Ottawa and Brussels. That's the only way to effectively do this, to accomplish something under the law. I think you want accomplishment. Uh, because that's the only thing that's going to save uh, your business and save all of the bad things which are going to happen as a result of that. I can politically posture and get you know a lot of applause and a lot of hoo -hahs. I want to do something that's effective. And this is about the only thing that we can do that's effective. Thank you. Okay. Rachel Buff of uh, East Moreland in Brookfield. Um. Mr. Sensenbrenner, I've been following your career. I'm an immigration historian for a long time here in Wisconsin. And I guess I have a lot of questions, but not that much time. So my question, in summary, is I don't know, given the current crisis of the separation of families, that's very much brought on by Homeland Security Policy, and you're, you've been very involved in um, advocating for a wall, advocating for more criminalization of immigrants. I honestly don't know. And I'd like your response. I honestly don't know on human rights how you said that. Well, first of all, the first indication of the sovereignty of any country is to protect its borders. Our borders are leaky as a city. And everybody knows that. And there have been a lot of illegal immigrants that have entered into our country. Now, this is nothing new. Uh, back when Jimmy Carter was president, uh, he uh, uh, appointed a Blue Ribbon Commission that was headed by the late father Theodore Hesburgh, who was the president of Notre Dame University for a very long period of time. He was the chair of the Civil Rights Commission, and he was a very proud political liberal in his day. And he made a comprehensive report, which was after Carter left office to President Reagan, uh, that made a lot of suggestions, but one of them that he was very firm on was he said that if we grant an amnesty to illegal immigrants, we are only encouraging more illegal immigration into our country. And the thing is, is that uh, uh, an amnesty bill was passed. It was signed by President Reagan. I didn't vote for it, but on this one, Father Hesburgh was right and President Reagan was wrong. But we've gone from about 3 million illegal immigrants in the country uh, at the time of the amnesty to somewhere between 11 to 20 million, and nobody knows exactly how many. Please let me finish, ma'am. Uh, there was another Blue Ribbon Commission that was headed by uh, Barbara Jordan, who made her name for herself in the House of Representatives, uh, on impeachment of uh, President Nixon. And she basically same, came to the same conclusion, that granting amnesty to illegal immigrants would end up uh, encouraging more illegal immigration. And these were political liberals of the day uh, that were, uh, you know, that made that conclusion. I'll give you a chance to, you know, ask, ask a follow-up when I'm done. Uh, now, you know, our immigration system is a mess. We need to do two things. First of all, we need to discourage illegal immigration. 
Uh, because if we don't do that, and we pass some kind of an amnesty or earned legalization or whatever you want to call it, uh, usually the people who would benefit from that would end up becoming U.S. citizens before people who did not break the law and who applied uh, for an immigrant visa and were very patiently waiting uh, for their name to get to the top of the pile. It depends upon what country uh, uh, they are, they are nationals of. The effect of that is, is that you will have the illegal immigrant becoming a citizen quicker than the one who is using the system, the legal system, and the result of that will be that we will slowly slam the door of legal immigration shut because it is much easier to come to the United States illegally than it will be to follow the law and do it legally. That would be a tragedy in my opinion uh, because unless you're a Native American, we are a country of immigrants. Uh, and uh, I think we should be encouraging legal immigration. Uh, we may want to change the system of what preferences one has. Uh, you know, that probably is an ancillary uh, uh, issue, but we have to uh, discourage illegal immigration, both through border security and through law enforcement at the border and internally, as well as cutting off the magnet for uh, dishonest employers to break the law by hiring illegal immigrants you know, not giving them any benefits, paying them in cash, not taking out the withholding, uh, you know, and, and all of that. So, you know, that's, you know, that's what I think that we have to do. Now, what's going on now, you know, is basically a result of about five successive presidents not wanting to do anything, and the problem is compounded and compounded and compounded. And I'm talking about Reagan and both Bushes and Clinton and Obama, so I, my criticism, you know, is bipartisan. I think we've got to get at the root cause of it, and, you know, we've got to be able to secure, you know, the border particularly, because a lot of the people who pay coyotes to smuggle them across the border also act as mules, you know, for illegal drugs. And a good part of the opioids and fentanyl that come into the United States are smuggled across the border by people who hire uh, the uh, uh, coyotes to, to bring them across the border. So this is, you know, a law enforcement and a social problem given the opioid epidemic that we have in this, this country. You know, my feeling is, you know, number one, the law to be enforced. We've all known what the law is. You know, number two, I do favor some kind of a physical barrier on the wall on the border, not necessarily a wall uh, through the full southern border, uh, but the Border Patrol tells us that if there was a physical barrier, it would slow down the people who were illegally crossing and give them enough time to get them up there to apprehend them before they're able to disappear into the United States. That, I think, is very, very important. The other thing that, I, in my opinion, needs to be done is that the Mexican government needs to secure their southern border because a lot of the people who are here and detained, including 10,000 kids, separated from their families while they were still in Central America and came as unaccompanied minors through Mexico and across the border. And the other 2,000, you know, who are detained, you know, came came with their families, or 3,000. You know, there's been a there's been a new there's been a new estimate on that. Uh, you know, while the new president of Mexico, you know, uh, ran as a very proud leftist, his words not mine. One of the parts of his platform was that he was going to secure the southern border of Mexico to prevent all of this from happening. And I say amen to that, and God bless you, AMRO. It's the, it's the nickname of, of the president-elect uh, of Mexico. You know, we had a couple of votes last week, you know, which uh, would have, you know, brought families to, uh, together that, you know, are separated and that are here in the United States. We've got a problem with a, ju a judge's ruling, you know, that, you know, uh, says that families have to be brought together, but there's another judge's ruling that says you cannot detain, you know, a juvenile in a federal detention facility, not necessarily 
to prison uh, while their parents, you know, are being held waiting for, uh, you know, their cases to be adjudicated. We're going to have to work that out uh, on that. Uh, you know, unfortunately, we weren't able to. But I said since last October that Republicans who have opposed, you know, doing anything with the DACA kids, uh, except put them up for deport, deport, deportation, you know, have compromised and said, you know, we'll, you know, do something to keep the DACA kids here. So this is a, a cave, if you will, on the part of the Republicans. Uh, Trump says that that has got to go along with the wall for him to sign the bill or the uh, physical physical barriers. The Democrats have not caved. They have rejected, you know, every type of compromise that has DACA and the physical barrier in the same bill, and as a result, nothing has passed. Now I can say that it seems to me that the Democrats, led by Senator Schumer, who can block anything he wants to because of the filibuster rule in the Senate, are putting their opposition to Trump's physical barrier ahead of doing something humane and compassionate for the DACA kids. They'll have to answer for that. Now your follow-up. Um, thank you. You told me a lot of things that I've heard before. Um, I asked you a question. And in my classes, I teach. You have to answer the question. So I'm assuming that your answer is that you sleep very well when there are children in cages that have to be in Texas. That doesn't bother you the way to sleep. Well, you know, but I don't want you to answer the question. Okay, the fact, the fact of the matter is, is they entered the United States illegally. No, no, no. Do you sleep well? No, yes. I'll answer your question. Okay. I, I don't care. Uh, I'll, you know, I'll answer your question. The question is where do you put them? Uh, do you sleep well at night? It's a very simple question. Yes, yes, I sleep fine. very well at night. Because, <laughs> you, know, the, you know, the thing is, is that, you know, I don't, where do you put them? They entered the United States. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, may I ask you a question now? Okay, where do you put them? Where do you put them? Um, you do not separate children from their parents. You put them together in facilities. In, in homes, you let them in, you let them wait for their very long backlog in the asylum areas in this country, which is another part of our immigration system that's broken. You let them be with their families. You keep families together. You do not detain them in private prisons, which are making money for many, many people in this country, including Republicans, including many allies of our current president. You let people come who come from countries that are ravaged by wars waged by the United States. Why is that the police to save Trump's city in the hemisphere? Because of the dirty wars of the U.S. Act. Because of the rule of the U.S. Act. So you, you give people refuge. It's what the U.N. High Commission on Refugees said in 1951, and we are not in, in, in any kind of compliance there. Okay. Well, that's really bad thing if you're going to say Well. Um, Over 95% of the people who were ordered to appear before a judge did not show up. And the judge issued a call to, excuse me, number four. Uh, make it number five. Okay, I'll be uh, You know, 95% of the people did not show up. And you know, there, there was a default deportation order that was entered by the judge. And uh, that got put in the computer. And when somebody was pulled over on a traffic stop, you know, the fact that there was what amounted to a bench warrant pending against them uh, had the driver of the car, whether full of kids or not full of kids, taken to custody by the officer and returned to the court that ordered the appearance. Now, this would happen to any of us as United States citizens or permanent resident aliens. If we got a traffic citation and we didn't either pay the fine or we didn't show up in court on the return date that was on the citation that the officer handed us, we could be driving down the road and there would be a bench warrant that would be issued by uh, the judge. And if we were pulled over in a traffic stop, we would be taken into custody and returned to the court. Now, why should somebody who blew off a court appearance before an immigration judge 
be treated any better than a United States citizen who blew off, you know, a, a traffic citation and didn't pay the fine and didn't show up in court when they were supposed to. It's the same process. I believe in equal justice under the law. What you do by giving preference to illegal immigrants that blow off court dates is unequal justice. They get better justice than Americans do, and that's not right. <laughs> separated because you you know the law says that because the kid was not arrested but the parents were the parents had to be put in some kind of a detention facility which is what caused the separation to begin with now president trump signed an executive order to end that and i give him credit for it the other question i have is how about the ten thousand you know yeah, that are in custody down. at the border who voluntarily oh. separated You're from their families yeah. in central america and then were brought through mexico and across the border by coyote should, in the name of family reunification should we load them all on planes and drop them off at some airport in central america or not and you know there's a, you know there's a lack of consistency on both sides you know I, you know, I take the position that we shouldn't drop them all off, uh, uh, fly it back and drop them all off, but, you know, to be consistent that all kids should be reunited with their families, the 10,000 that voluntarily separated from their families, maybe they shouldn't be treated any differently than the ones that stayed with their families and were involuntarily separated after they uh, got into the United States. Right. So, I guess, I can, like, question related to that is, if the previous administrations were failing in enforcing the law because they weren't going through what you just said, why is the Trump administration any different from not enforcing those same laws? Because Trump ran on doing something like that, and he's fulfilling his campaign promises. Right, you know, it should, it should be no surprise to anybody, because Trump said what he was going to do during the campaign, and he was elected. Right, but you said that that reform has to come through legislation, not by executive order. I believe it does. And, you know, I tried to do something, and I could have done something with, you know, a compromise with the Senate in 2004 and 2005. And, you know, that got, you know, that got voted down. And, you know, I, I believe from the bottom of my heart, you know, that if a compromise, which would have, you know, given some type of uh, legal status uh, to the undocumented immigrants in the country, and that would have been part of the compromise, but not citizenship, you know, had become law. We would not be talking about this issue today, but there are always some that wanted to make the perfect the enemy of the good. My legislation failed, and we're all here today talking about issues which really haven't changed very much over the last 13 years. Sure, and if I, if I may just have one more question. Sure. Can I can respond to that. Um, so I understand uh, like your efforts to compromise and other people's efforts to compromise. But if the argument can be applied to other administrations that there should not be this executive ability to choose which laws are to be enforced, why is the Trump administration any different when it's not choosing to enforce some laws and choosing to enforce some laws in regard to this immigration problem? Well, uh, you know, first, first of all, the Congress does not enforce any laws. You know, that's not a shtick under the Constitution. <coughs> You know, it's up to the president, you know, and it's up to the attorney general, you know, who is the chief law enforcement officer of the country, you know, to decide where to use uh, uh, the resources that Congress has given them through appropriations uh, in, you know, in the, the best possible manner. Uh, and, you know, I can tell you that when I was trying to reach some kind of a compromise, the current attorney general as United States Senator from Alabama wasn't very helpful. 
So, sorry, if, if I use this. Go ahead. Okay. So, if if there isn't any problem with the current administration choosing to reunite the families, why is there any problem with any of the way the previous administration has enforced this? Well, uh, you know, what I can say is the detention facilities for juveniles, most of whom were unaccompanied, you know, that was set up by the Obama administration. Uh, what has changed, uh, you know, is that there are now uh, juveniles uh, that are accompanied by their parents, you know, and that's why, you know, we end up, uh, you know, having the, the debate on that. Now, I'm not so sure that Trump's executive order is constitutional, and I think that means that it is incumbent upon uh, Congress, and when we get back there next week, uh, to come up with something to protect the families. Uh, you know, however, you've got these two court decisions, uh, you know, that basically say that uh, 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 the juveniles can be detained, you know, only for 20 or 30 days. Uh, on that, and, you know, so this is not as easy as just passing a law that says ICE and the Border Patrol shall not split families apart because there are court decisions. Thank you very much. Uh, Reverend Suzelle Leach of Brookfield. Hello, Mr. Sanchez I'm the pastor of Unitarian Universalist Church West, just over here on North Avenue. And, and here with my congregation of 600 adults, children, and youth, quietly behind me. Um, I am deeply concerned about the separation of families at the border, but I'm also here to talk with you about the abolition of ICE and the demand for a system uh, that understands the causes for migration. Does, do you understand why people migrate? Why are people coming across our borders? Well, of course, because the standard of living in the United States is better than most places other than in the world. And we can't take everybody here. That's, that's the problem. Is that your only understanding of why people migrate? Uh, you know, there's civil wars in places. Uh, you know, there is a lot of lack of law and order in places, including Central American countries, but it's the, they're sovereign countries, and that is the issue of their own democratically elected governments, because every government in Central America is democratically elected. And, you know, the point that I would make is I think abolishing ICE is absolutely the wrong way to go. Because if you abolish ICE, then you'll have local law enforcement enforce the immigration laws because there will be no federal agency that is set up to do that. And I don't think many immigration advocates really would like to have local law enforcement throughout the country enforce the immigration laws. No, of course not. That's well, then who would? Well, perhaps there is a more appropriate federal agency that could do that. And of course, the Department of Homeland Security is not the appropriate agency to be overseeing immigration matters itself. Well, before that uh, department was set up, it was handled by the Justice Department. Uh, Why was that changed? That was changed because you know it was determined that immigration matters, you know, were more appropriately at Homeland Security, you know, by the Congress at the time. This was after 9/11. And at that time, uh, the whole issue of Homeland Security ended up getting raised to the level of cabinet position. Um, and, you know, you have to realize that a leaky border, you know, not only, you know, encourages illegal immigration, it encourages drug smuggling, as I've referred to, and also you have a <coughs> way of determining if there are terrorists that are coming uh, across the border and uh, uh, disappearing, you know, into the United States, waiting for the orders from overseas to blow us all up. I'm not sure. Yeah. yeah. One of my fellow Brookfieldians here. It seems to me there's an awful lot of difference in the way that we look at terrorism these days. Um, there are an awful lot of quote unquote lone wolves in the United States who are uh, wreaking, you know, multiple shootings 
mass shootings upon us who yes, are not from other countries. Yes, well, Why are those not being terrorists? By our, they are. And you know, as a matter of fact, uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, in 2006, I amended the Patriot Act uh, to include uh, the type of tools that law enforcement has with lone wolf terrorists who, you know, are not affiliated with, you know, an organized terrorist group like ISIS or Al Qaeda. Uh, my good friends on the left oppose most of that. Okay. <laughs> Mary Roth, Beaumont Avenue in Brookfield. Hi. Um, I lived in Brookfield for 17 years. Um, I'm also uh, a fellow UW law grad like you. I graduated from law school 23 years ago. Um, but I've taken a very different path than you did. When I graduated, I got out and I started working. And I didn't take the highest. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't take the highest paying job. I didn't take the job that gave me the most power and attention. I started working at a small firm and I started working with the people. And then I went to the police academy because I had been a prosecutor and I thought I could help people better as a police officer. And that was great. And then I started working for corporations and I saw all the greed and how they mistreated their employees. And then I started working for myself. And I went to grad school and I studied economic development and I studied um, planning in the city. And now I work for myself, I speak three languages and I help a lot of immigrants and people who are hurt by the current policy of immigration and your so-called tax cuts that hasn't helped any of the people who are lower class or middle class, and they will not help anyone like that. I'm appalled by your president and how he treats women. I'm appalled by your president and how racist he is, and I am gonna say it, he's racist. And I'm appalled And I'm appalled that people don't stand up to him. And I want you to go out there, and first of all, I want you to get your facts. Because with my experience going out there and talking with people and helping people and meeting people, my personal experiences with immigrants and people who are lower economic level, my experience is completely different than what you're saying is the fact. So I would encourage you to go out there and meet people and talk with people and research and get the facts before you stand up to Trump. And I want you to stand up to Trump. I want you to tell him that people see through all of his lies and people see through all of his bullying and we want him to stop. So please talk it up. brought up, uh, Ms. Roth, were discussed during the election. He was elected. People who <laughs> were together when they voted. And they didn't vote for him. And he will be the President of the United States <coughs> January 20th, 2021. And uh, as, you know, as the President of the United States, you know, I would like to see people <coughs> at this on an issue by issue basis. You know, I spoke strongly against Trump's terrorists. As a Republican, you know, I think he's wrong on that issue. Uh, I don't see much support for the executive order that he signed to bring the families together from people who are on the other side. And it seems to me that when somebody does something you agree with, whether you voted for him or not, you ought to say so. So I am not going to be a knee-jerk Trump lover. I will urge people not to be knee-jerk Trump haters on that, and to look at what he does on each and every issue. And you know, I, you know, I am, you know, I am waiting to hear any of my friends from the left 
stand up and said Trump did the right thing when he signed that executive order to bring families back together. He, started, he signed the order to start the problem in the first place. It's a crisis he created. So, I, if, if I can, he was not yeah, he elected by yeah, the did. majority of this the is public. His the public. Uh, it was his policy. And, 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 and if, if, I, if I can finish, if I can finish, yes. you, you, you interrupted me. If you you like interrupted me. On you. Okay. But it was so, his. I also believe that with the investigations and all the indictments, there is clear evidence that he had help from a foreign government. Yes, he, he did. Acted yeah. I imagine you respect the law, and I'm sure as you are following things unfolding, you are appalled by what he has done and what the process is uncovering and what your colleagues are trying to do away with. Okay, let me respond this way. Mr. Mueller has had over a year to this. He's handed down some indictments. None of them have to do with the Trump campaign in cahoots with the Russians. Not one. Yeah. With all due respect, you are inside. Now, this is about the eighth interruption, because I'm keeping track of you. And my, you know, I asked you in the beginning, I know. be respectful to people who have opposite opinions than you, including me. And I would repeat that again. I do not want to adjourn this meeting early before 8.20. But if this keeps on going on, I'm going to have no other, uh, alternative but to do that. So, you know, remember we can disagree without being disagreeable. This is not uh, a meeting on who can yell the loudest, or who can applaud the most, or who interrupts whom. This is a meeting where we're supposed to discuss issues, many of which are conflicting. And I ask for your respect. Next up is Linda Boucher of Kevin Hour Drive in Brookfield. I want to thank you for the service. Are we taking to ensure there is monitoring for disease control and viruses um, and possible outbreaks? Because we are not people to take the health item. That was a uh, thing that was really taken care of. That was my first question. My understanding is that people who cross the border, you know, are kind of given a basic medical uh, review to see if they have any communicable diseases, just like when immigrants came uh, to Ellis Island. And, you know, most of that was whether you had TB or headlights. And if the answer was no, then it's you were fine with it. So are you checking medically? Yeah. Okay, um, and then my next question is, um, what are your ideas and suggestions for funding and for the improvement of the infrastructure for the religious institutions? Well, uh, you know, first of all, I'm against raising the gas tax because raising the gas tax is a regressive tax. All excise taxes are regressive taxes. And, you know, if you've got to drive 30 miles each way to and from work, uh, the gas price is going to be the same whether you're at a $20,000 a year job or a $250,000 a year job. So, you know, we shouldn't do it that way. Uh, uh, a lot of the roads are financed by states. You know, I don't like the federal highway fund because usually Wisconsin gets back less than we send to Washington. And I have voted to do away with it and the 18% federal or 18.3 cent federal gasoline tax. Let us collect it as a state tax and that way we can be sure to spend all of it here. Uh, the president is talking about public-private partnerships. Uh, the devil is in the details of that mm -hmm. and the details have not been released. So it's pretty hard to speculate, you know, how this will work. You know, let me say that I'm kind of a skeptic and then we'll get to the whole issue of toll roads. You know, I spend half the year out in D.C. And there is a toll road from in Virginia uh, for about 40% of the Capitol Beltway. And it's a voluntary toll road, but the uh, tolls end up varying. And then Highway 66, which is the main road 
from the area south of Dulles Airport into D.C. Uh, between 6 and 9.30 in the morning is all told. We can't go on that free. The last time I went out to see my dentist who practices out of Dulles Airport, for the nine miles on the Beltway that I went on so that I didn't be an hour and a half late because of the traffic jam, it cost me $16.40 to go nine and a half miles. There was a sign for going in on Highway 66 from the Beltway into the city it was $36.40 each way. Yeah. Nobody can afford that. And if that's the kind of public-private partnership we're talking about, help me out uh, on that, because that is nothing but a gouge. And I can tell you that 66 was all uh, uh, built with public money in the early 60s. The Beltway was mostly built with public money about the same period of time. So here people are being gouged to order or to use roads that were already paid for you know, by the taxes that were collected by the people who were driving at the time. That makes no sense to me. Okay. Uh, is it Ann Berry, Pilgrim Parkway? Anna. Hi, um, I'm a young woman who is looking to run for office once I graduate school, so I go to UW-Madison, and I've lived in Brookfield my whole life, and I want to thank you for your representation thus far. But looking forward and working in politics now, I work for um, Representative Chris Taylor, mm -hmm. and I've also worked with um, Marco Can, lots of other Democrats. Mm -hmm. And one thing I know progressive politics is really strong with is knowing when to step down for a new champion. Somebody who you know, knows more, is more understanding of their constituents, doesn't bang the gavel when there's applause for something that one of your constituents says and really means and is concerned about. Um, so when is it that time for you? you know, you've served 40 years, you know, you got your cane. When is it time for you to step down and make room for somebody else? One is, is that I was the principal house author of the comprehensive opioid treatment bill. Uh, that's something that we all ought to be for, uh, whether you're progressive or conservative. We need to do two things. We need to fund it, and it's not permanently funded. You need to tweak it, uh, because there's some things that didn't hit the mark you know, directly. And the other thing, which I've introduced a bill, which should be coming up in the House later this month, is to criminalize fentanyl analogs. Yes. You know, fentanyl is much more uh, uh, lethal than heroin is. The fentanyl analogs are more lethal than the fentanyl. I'm very familiar with it. I work on Tenny Baldwin's campus. Yeah, okay, well, that's fine. But most people here are not. Now, I'm the author of the bill. <laughs> I'm the author of the bill that will criminalize them and make them a scheduled narcotic, you know, like fentanyl. So fentanyl is used medically with a prescription to treat terminal cancer patients because it is good at, at dealing with pain. The second thing that I've spent quite a bit of time on for the last year and a half, and I get more support from progressives rather than conservatives, is prison reform. And, uh, the, you know, and prison reform requires three things, in my opinion. First of all, we ought to give vocational training to people who are in prison so they have a marketable skill when they get out. Secondly, we need a Second Chance program, and I was the author of the Second Chance Act, which is up for reauthorization, uh, to make sure that we can do our best to prevent them from repeat offending and going right back into jail. Okay, the Second Chance Act basically means uh, that they don't hang out with the people who got them into trouble to begin with. And the third thing, because of the way the mandatory minimum penalties work, uh, there are people that might have a grain of a controlled substance more that get a mandatory penalty when they're not doing any kind of narcotics <coughs> trafficking or pushing. And if they have a grain less of that when they get arrested by the police, you know, then they 
you know, then they do not get a mandatory permit. And in order to do that, you know, we need to have a probation program that works. Uh, and a lot of probation programs in many parts of the country today, you know, are uh, 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 calling in from your favorite drug house to your probation officer, you know, to say that you're behaving yourself, quotes on quotes, so you're around behaving yourself. You know, I worked for a year and a half with uh, Representative Bobby Scott, who is an African American Democrat from Virginia, that came up with, I think, a comprehensive plan that was revenue neutral uh, on it. You know, the money that we would save, you know, from not incarcerating nonviolent people who are not trafficking in drugs could pay for uh, the uh, vocational training in prison in the Second Chance program. So this isn't anything that would be a big drain on the taxpayers. And I want to get that through. And that's why I'm running again. And Do you both not of think these that things are things that progressives ought to be uh, uh, kind of in favor of. And I'm the exactly. one Republican that's been you know, sticking my neck out about this. Well, do you not think that a progressive leader can emerge in your position and do that exact job that you just said, where you want to support all these progressive values? Baldwin. No. She failed. No. She failed. Uh, no. She failed. Uh, oh, give her a check. Oh, it's a check mark. Yeah. Okay, yep, check okay. Mark. Okay. okay. Uh, failed at what? You know, let me say, you know, that somebody, you know, a freshman is not going to be able to be able to put together the coalitions to get that done because this is very difficult. Somebody with experience and an institutional knowledge. I've been asked to run, actually, like locally in Madison, so I have a lot of experience in the political yeah, world. And I work with many people you know, who have okay, a lot more. I'm time. talking about the United States Congress and the United States Congress. Mark Hokan. You know, okay. Well, he hasn't been very helpful. Either. So. He actually just authored a bill to try and abolish ICE. So, I mean, I think he's moving in the right direction. Yeah, yeah. yeah. to help. Well, if yeah. 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 yeah, maybe he should ask who would be enforcing the immigration laws inside the U.S. With no ICE, there will be the local police doing that. And I've been involved in the immigration issue long enough. Good. Most immigration advocates do not want the local police to do that. I think the local police are just fine and be able to do that, but I think when that issue comes up to many people in this room, uh, they will be having second thoughts of abolishing guys. But it does look good on a bumper sticker. Ravina Sakya of Ridgeway Road in Brookfield. Hi, Representative I went to Brookfield Central, which is right here. Uh, I really like it there, but there's kind of a lingering fear in the back of my mind about a potential intruder. There are less than 30 weeks in 2018, there's been about 23 different school shootings. Um, and frankly, they indicate that you voted yes on a bill to reduce the waiting period of buying a gun from three days to one day. I was just curious about your rationale on that. So. Well, you know, for, you know, first of all, waiting periods do not necessarily uh, you know, do not necessarily solve the problem. What we do need to do, and I don't recall voting for that bill, you know, I did vote for the Brady bill in uh, the early uh, decade of the 90s, you know, and I was a co-sponsor of that bill, and that had a five-day waiting period, but the waiting period sunsetted when the instant check system ended up being up and running. It took about five years to be able to do that. I was the one who was insistent that the instant check system uh, be put in uh, to our uh, national firearms laws because for 80 years it has been illegal for anybody with either a felony conviction or uh, a, a mental incompetency adjudication uh, to buy or possess or attempt to buy or attempt to possess any type of firearm whatsoever, no exceptions at all. And putting that database in the instant check system, you know, will, you know, allow, you know, a gun dealer to be able to determine, you know, whether or not somebody has uh, got that kind of a record and is thus uh, not able to legally purchase a firearm. And I can say that since it was up and running, there were 4.7 million sales that were stopped, you know, by uh, the uh, instant check system 
And again, you know, I claim to be the father of the instant check system uh, because I was able to get people who said waiting periods or everything or know we should never do any checking at people, you know, who, you know, can't legally own firearms. And I will say that people who have had the domestic violence uh, restraining orders entered against them have been added to the instant check system. What was done at the end of last year was that we provided a quarter of a billion dollars to put data into the instant check system, either from jurisdictions that have refused to do so, or the military, because they said the court martial uh, decisions, you know, were not the same type as in any type of a civilian court. Well, that, you know, a bunch of bunk in terms of the danger. I support something that is controversial that uh, uh, Senator Rubio has proposed, you know, that allows uh, someone who has shown a, uh, a mental proclivity to injure themselves or injure somebody else, but has not yet injured anybody else. Uh, they have either the police or school authorities, uh, you know, or social service authorities to go into court and get a temporary order that would put that person's name and data into uh, the national instant check system. The reason I think we have to do that as the law says, is that you cannot force anybody into an evaluation or a treatment unless they're a danger to themselves or a danger to others. And the only way you'll get the judge to uh, be able to say that that person is a danger to others is when they actually hurt somebody or kill them, which means it's too late. So we're going to have to do something proactively and for it to be constitutional, we've got to have the due process before the fact rather than after. Uh, after the fact, uh, my su crime subcommittee did have a hearing in February about uh, the Parkland, Florida school shooter, Mr. Cruz. And what uh, I had the deputy director of the FBI up, and it's the first time I ever heard you know, the FBI admitted that they made a mistake. You know, what the deputy director said was in November, before the February school shooting, uh, there was a guy who was surfing the net, you know, who found a uh, Mr. Cruz uh, saying that he wanted to become a professional school shooter. The guy called up the FBI as any good citizen should, uh, reported that. The FBI uh, sent an agent out to the guy's house and a computer key, uh, and they took down the information, but they had no way of knowing whether Cruz was an alias or Cruz was a real person. Fast forward to after the first of this year, um, uh, one of Cruz's neighbors said that there were 39 911 calls because of domestic disturbances that Cruz created. She reported that to the FBI, uh, that the local police did respond. Uh, the clerk that took the information looked at it, said this is something that the FBI does not have an interest in, did not report it, and essentially threw it away. Now. Uh, the FBI is fixing that, and we will be getting <coughs> we will be getting a response when they have it fixed to say how they're doing it. What does irritate me, however, is there are a lot of my colleagues, you know, that run around uh, saying that they passed a bill that will solve the problem, but really has not solved the problem. Uh, for example, uh, about ten years ago, Congress passed a bill that made it a crime to uh, carry a firearm within a thousand feet of any school, and that's true of law enforcement. Now that sure didn't do any good with any of these school shootings, did it? Because, you know, anybody had committed a federal felony as soon as they got within a thousand feet of any school. Both well, Congress and the state legislature, you know, have passed legislation, you know, to harden school buildings, uh, to provide money uh, to help pay for either active or retired law enforcement to be you know, close to the door of the school you know, and have a buzz-in system when school is in session so somebody just can't walk in and start firing away. And I support all that, too. <coughs> okay. Uh, is it Vivek Srivastana? Uh, uh, it's 
So in 2001, you passed the Patriot Act, yeah. uh, which was uh, after 9 11 to ensure national security. Uh, with this came a lot of, uh, I guess you could say, a surveillance state. And as the ACLU reports, African Americans are 2.5 times more likely to be surveyed upon, and this ultimately leads to like mass persecution and etc. And then, once again, when Edward Snowden uh, exposed this youth in, 20, in the 2010-2011 time frame, in 2012 he wanted to reamend uh, the 1917 Espionage Act, where we punish uh, the media companies that we create. And then all of a sudden, in 2013, you came out with the U.S. Freedom Act or something like that, that essentially says that uh, people that do, or like that say, that like, went on the NSA for having the surveillance system in general. So at the end of the day, my question is, is why did you introduce a policy and then keep on going back and forth with it and keep on changing your stance? Well, first of all, with the Freedom Act, you know, I realized that uh, the NSA and the intelligence community went far beyond the intent of Congress and how they applied the Freedom Act. It was never supposed to pick out everybody's home records, tributes of them, you know, every year. And what the Freedom Act did is it's been the first time since 1978 where the powers of the intelligence community, you know, ended up being curtailed. And Senator Lady from Mount Mount and I started out alone on that. As a matter of fact, uh, President Obama called me full of crap in the Oval Office, and he ended up changing his mind when he saw what was going on. Now, with the Patriot Act, uh, the Patriot Act had 16 features in it, and the lone wolf of uh, terrorist was the 17th that was added later. Uh, a lot of that brought the law up to date. And one of the things that I was insisted on is that there be the Sunset and the Freedom Act, and I said that I would be holding a separate hearing on each of the 16 provisions of the Patriot Act uh, that were uh, passed in 2001. It ended up that 14 of the 16 provisions were non-controversial, and the ACLU even testified you know, in favor of a lot of them. One of them, for example, was it busted down the wall where the CIA and the FBI couldn't talk to each other which was one of the reasons why uh, uh, we couldn't connect the dots and 9-11 happened. Because some of the people who were hijackers, you know, were those that blew up the USS Cole in the airport in Yemen, and on the airport in the seaport in Yemen. So that was you know, taken, uh, uh, that was taken down, and the FBI has been uh, talking to each other uh, uh, and the CIA as well, and that has made America uh, safer. You know, a lot of them, you know, expanded the terrorism, uh, what uh, the FBI and uh, other law enforcement were able to do with drug trafficking and racketeering uh, on that. And if you, they could do it with drug trafficking and racketeering, uh, they ought to be able to do it with people who were planning on conducting a terrorist act in the United States. Uh, so, uh, you know, what I'm saying is, is, you know, the thing is that it is not perfect but what I can say is when I saw that the executive branch was using a law that I had authored, I got up and had the guts to say they were doing that and put together the coalition to bring that back. And there aren't very many people who actually say their own law has been abused and we've got to fix it. I did it and I got it fixed. Can I have a quick follow-up? Sure. So uh, you, you claim that you didn't expect for this surveillance abuse to happen, correct? Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what, what the no, I'll okay, tell you what the legal rationale was. In 2006, uh, when the Patriot Act came up for one of its reauthorizations, uh, the Bush administration asked us to limit the uh, uh, the scope of the uh, surveillance the things that were relevant to a terrorist attack. Now, practically everybody in the room said that if it wasn't relevant before, and it is relevant now, it's limiting. You know, that's kind of basic English. Well, what the Justice Department did is they went into the secret FISA court, which we opened up a bit uh, in the Freedom Act, and said that relevant meant that they could grab anything that may be relevant. 
which instead of limiting it, expanded it. And when we know the Ralph Revelation, you know, we found out that they were taking everybody's uh, call records. They couldn't get the uh, uh, content of the call without a warrant. But call records, you know, length of the call, time of day, who you called, and oh things goodness. like that. Five trillion of them a year, and then story them. And, you know, that was not what was, the Patriot Act never would have passed, and I never would have supported it had that uh, been the intention. But they got this Pfizer court order that nobody knew about until the Snowden revelation, and when I found out about it, I was horrified and fixed it. Well, one, when you found out about it, you actually proposed in 2012 to amend the 1917 Espionage Act to prosecute the people who uh, released these things. But back to what I was saying briefly, in about 1990, 1991, Deepa Kumar, Rutgers University, released a really comprehensive study about how when you expand the surveillance state, you entrench the discrimination, racism, and all the harms that happen to that towards minorities. Well, uh, I, I understand how that took you like 12, 13 years ago. Well, you know, I, you know, I disagree with that. And, uh, you know, I, you know, people ought to be prosecuted for leaking classified information. Uh, they are, they ought to be. Uh, is it God <coughs> wants <coughs> to go to Brookfield? Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Brenner, for your service. I support most of the items in um, immigration law as it's being presented um, in the Congress and certainly a number of the items that you have um, said that you are for. However, one that seems to not be on the list sometimes that I have curiosity about is E-Verify because that gets at those employers you were talking about that hire the um, illegal people who are here uh, not giving them a fair wage for conditions, etc. And I believe that e verifying needs to be an important part of any immigration program so that you can then establish after that a guest worker program that would let someone come in and work. Yeah, I am, would you, I am in um, favor of mandatory e verify for all the hires. Uh, and you know one of the problems that you have is, is with temporary workers, particularly uh, in the ag industry. Uh, you know, there are two types of temporary workers, you know, one are the permanent ones that milk the cows year round, and the others are the temporary ones that harvest crops like in the Central Valley of California. Uh, this will help turn off the magnet that brings illegal immigrants into the United States, you know, if they can't get jobs. So, uh, where the problem is, is that, is with the details on the temporary worker program, I think that sometime this month we will have an e-verify ag jobs type bill that will come up separately. Thank you. Uh, Tashin Husseini, Indian Trail Brookfield. Uh, uh, Secretary Azar you know, appeared before a Senate committee and promised that, and uh, I believe today, or maybe before the close of business on the 3rd, uh, the number of alien children in custody ended up being increased from 2,000 to a little bit less than 3,000. So that's, you know, that's what's happening. You know, I talked earlier about, you know, the, the problems with the court uh, the decisions. I do support what the president is trying to do. I think we're going to have to back it up with legislation, but we're going to have to deal with those court decisions. And threading that needle is not as simple as it looks. Okay, but beyond the numbers, what about what's actually happening with the children? Mm -hmm. The mother, I mean, that's a great concern to all of us. Yeah, and, 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 you know, I, and you know, I agree with that. Uh, one of the things that Trump did was rather than having the asylum applications be heard in a first in, first out uh, matter by an asylum officer and an immigration judge, he's now turned it into last in, first out. So the new arrivals get close to the top of the list. And that means that the people will have their day in court, you know, making a determination on uh, uh, whether or not they qualify for asylum under our laws. 
Uh, Nancy Cormani. Yes. Um, thank you, Congressman Pedro. I just want just to, if you could clarify things just a little bit more, just to piggyback that young gentleman's comments about you know immigration. But, uh, the the individuals that are coming here through a port of entry mm -hmm. right now, those individuals can seek asylum. Yes. All right as opposed to individuals who are coming in illegally. Those individuals then have to be sent back. Is that well, correct? Yes and no. Okay. That's, all of these answers are yes and no. And I'm sorry about that. You know, the individuals who cross the border illegally, if they are asylum eligible, they can claim asylum. However, you know, what we've had, you know, as a provision, I think since the Clinton administration, or maybe since early in the Bush administration, uh, is that uh, people who are nationals of countries that border on the United States, which means Canada, not so much, and yeah, Mexico most of the time, you know, they're given a brief interview and sent back immediately. It's the other than Mexicans or the OTMs you know, that have to go through a more elaborate process. And uh, 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 that, I think, is going to, you know, have to be uh, refined somewhat uh, because, you know, with the current Mexican government, you know, you know just not enforcing their southern border and the coyotes bringing all these kids, you know, who separate from their families in Honduras or Guatemala you know, and pay a coyote to come on up, you know. That's a problem for the Mexicans, too, you know, as well as a problem, you know, if they are able to get across the border illegally. So there's going to have to be some kind of change in the OT, OTM policy. But, you know, I do give a lot of credit to uh, Lopez Obrador, uh, 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 the new uh, newly elected president of Mexico, you know, saying that he wants to enforce his southern border because that will solve a lot of his problems and a lot of our problems. Uh, Michael Clayson, the state Lane Brookfield. Congressman, uh, when I came tonight, I was going to bring up the issue of the children being separated. I was very disappointed to hear that you're sleeping well, because I personally have not been sleeping well. Exactly. I the of what my country has done. Exactly. But I want to move on to the second issue, because that one has been talked about. Um, I was interested by your comments regarding the young gentleman's talk about the Patriot Act and your, um, and I do understand your involvement with the Patriot Act and the fact that you did fix it by once the revelations were made about the extent of the collection of data. However, I do agree, it seems a little incongruous that you were really and truly upset about what was taking place, but then yet, did I hear you right to say that you still feel it's bad that people made that information available to the public? Mm -hmm. that Mr. I, mean, I haven't said you know anything. Well, it is your position. We're I haven't said, said anything about the Snowden leaks. Okay. You know, the Snowden leaks were very informative. So what is it? They were informative. Mm -hmm. That is your position that the Snowden leaks were informative. That's right. Okay. I hope they so, were to you too. They were. Okay. All right, so but in Florida, does that mean uh, but you still feel there should be the, the worst punishments for people who have leaked information that shows how damaging the actions of the government have been? Mm -hmm. The answer to the question is I think people who are leakers should be prosecuted. And it will be up to the jury to decide whether they're guilty or innocent. And if they're guilty, the judge should sentence them. And that's not the prerogative of Congress. That's the prerogative of you know, the executive branch in determining whether or not to indict them and the judicial branch, you know, to try them and find them guilty or innocent and if guilty, sentence them. What's your position on the information that Mr. Snowden gave? Mr. Snowden gave information. I got the information and showed that uh, the law that I sponsored was defective and was not being implemented in the way that it should have been. I found out that the secret court completely misinterpreted the word relevant, as I said in response uh, uh, to the earlier question. And I said that something had to be done about it, and I got it done. 
Okay, so if Mr. Stone comes back to the United States and if you were part of the jury, what would you judge? <laughs> well, the jury doesn't punish people. The judge the has to Do you judge. feel then that he is, should be punished for what he did? Speculative. Well, I believe that for leaking classified information, he should be prosecuted. Yes. Uh, you know, he signed a contract, you know, with the United States government, and he broke the contract. And when people break contracts, should they be able to get this boys got free because they did something that was, quote, socially good, unquote? Do you think when he signed a contract, he realized the information he would find? And what a crap I, 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 no I, I, I have no idea I what's in the man's mind. I disagree mind. with your, your statement about while he signed a contract. I'd like to move on to the third did. issue. <laughs> I'd like to move on to the third issue in guns. You mentioned guns, the young lady who has <laughs> since left. Uh, and I heard you say that, um, yes, you did. Are supportive of instant background checks. Uh, I can't recall what your position is, and if you tell me what is your position on expansion of background checks to gun shows and other private types of sales? I'm opposed to uh, uh, expanding background checks to private sales. You know, if a grandfather, you know, wants to give his hunting rifle to his grandson, uh, you know, I think that he should not. You know, have to find out, you know, where his grandson would end up getting cleared uh, under the NICS system. What about gun shows? Gun shows, a lot of those are private sales too. People are not in the business, you know, if they're selling one or two guns, you know, in the business of selling firearms. Okay, so you, you are not in favor of gun shows? I am in favor of anybody who is in the business. Trading in firearms for a business being required to clear uh, the uh, sales that are being proposed through the NICS system. 4.7 million of them got stopped. And even the Brady campaign, which is one of the leading groups, said the most effective gun control measure that has been passed in the last 25 years is the NICS system. Thank you. Uh, one last one, and before we go to personal problems time, and that's Nancy Glow of Bennington and Brookfield. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm concerned about global warming, but unfortunately it has, it has become thought of as a liberal issue. That is why I was very encouraged to hear about the Climate Solutions Caucus, a group in the House of Representatives that includes 42 Republican members. And here's my question. Do you see more interest among Republicans in working across the aisle and taking mean, meaningful action on climate change? If it's done with two things in mind, you know, one is, is the climate change, whatever solution there be, be universal and apply to all countries? And secondly, that it does not result, you know, in the export and outsourcing of American businesses to third world countries. Uh, both the Kyoto Protocol and the Paris Accord, you know, did not apply equally to all countries. It basically gave uh, countries like China and India a get out of jail free card until at least 2030, which is still 12 years, you know, away. Uh, and, you know, it still would have resulted in the outsourcing of American businesses. I think that both of these treaties were skewed against the United States. Uh, and I have opposed both of them. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, the second part of the meeting will be 